Hello, my name is Thomas Jones and this is my ARCS 2010 Experimental Archaeology video presentation. All through history, there have been countless great civilizations. This greatness could have come from the wealth of the civilization, its ability to expand its territory, wage war, gain control of large areas, and other peoples. But the most obvious way to represent one's power was to create something that might outlive the individual's life, the civilization of which they represent, and possibly all civilizations. This physical representation of power often culminated in the form of architecture and construction using huge bricks of stone as the primary building materials. This meant the transportation of megaliths from quarries to the building site, which were often hundreds of kilometers away. How did these ancient people move these megaliths with the technologies that they had? Were some methods better than others? And did technological advancement make this task easier? These are some of the questions I hope to find out with this experiment. To do this, I'll be enlisting the help of an excavator to drag different weights representing these stone bricks using different transportation methods that have been cited in the literature. To quantify this, I'll be using a load cell that I have borrowed from the University of Queensland Civil Engineering Department. This load cell measures tension in negative kilonewtons, which can then be converted into kilogram force. And for the means of this experiment, one negative kilonewton will represent 102 kilograms. To represent the bricks, I'll firstly be using 15 cement filled cinder blocks with a combined total weight of 450 kilograms as my base brick and then adding a pallet filled with rocks and steel with a weight of 383 kilograms, making the total weight 833 kilograms. I've chosen to use two different weights to see if there is a correlation between a particular transport method and a heavier or lighter brick, and to see if the forces needed differ more significantly with each transportation method using the heavier weights. I will be testing four different transportation methods, all of which, although primitive, have differing levels of technology and have been used by different civilizations. The first test will be a base run, where the bricks will be dragged along unmanipulated ground. For the second test, I will soak and compact the ground to try and reach a level of cementation that may reduce the frictions acting on the bricks. For the third test, I will construct a simple sled, place the weights on the sled and drag it along unmanipulated ground. For the fourth and final test, I will drag this sled along a simple track. Let's jump into the experiment. This is a quick demonstration on how to use the load cell where we plug the indicator into a 240 volt power source and then plug the indicator into the load cell. Here we see how the weights of the pellets were able to be obtained with the generator powering the indicator which is in turn connected to the load cell just out of frame. This is where we see the negative 3.757 kilonewton measurement which can be converted into roughly 383 kilograms. Let's have a look at how the first couple of tests went with the unmanipulated ground. By plotting the data on a bar graph, the differences in the forces resulting from each transportation method will be more easily seen and hopefully a trend will appear. Now let's add a bit of water and compaction and see what happens with the results. This technique of hydrolubrication and compaction has been suggested as a possible mode of lithic transportation used by the ancient Egyptians. When this data is plotted against the control, a decrease in the forces experienced is seen, 
with a 12.5% decrease for the 450kg weight and a 5% decrease for the 833kg weight. Now it's time to make the sled and run tests 5 and 6 with the sled on the unmanipulated ground. For the sled I decided to have three lengths of timber running parallel to try and increase the sled's structural stability. Each of these lengths were about 110 centimeters long and they all had 30 degree angles cut into the leading edge. For the platform on which the weights were to sit on, I used two thin pieces of timber, which I then screwed into place. When the sled tension results are plotted against the control and compaction tests, a further decrease in force is seen. This time the 450kg weight experienced 25% less tension than the control and the 833kg test experienced 26% less tension. Let's see what happens to the forces when we add a simple track underneath the sled. When the sled and track tension results are plotted against the control, compaction and simple sled tests, another decrease in force is seen. This time both the 450kg and the 833kg weights experienced a tension that was 52% less than the tensions experienced in the control test. Due to the fact that no real evidence has ever been found showing how sleds and tracks may have been utilised in the transportation of megaliths, these results can only be used as data showing that as the technology may have increased, i.e. moving from the control through to the track and sled, the less force would have been needed to pull the stones. The use of stones and sleds has been suggested to have played a part in megalith transport in Egypt, Easter Island, Mesopotamia and Britain, though these are purely educated guesses. So we saw that in the test that there was a 52% decrease in the forces exerted on the object when the weight was moved on the sled and track. But what do these numbers mean? Essentially, this means that if it took 10 people to move the object on the unmanipulated ground, it would only take 5 people to move the same weight if it was placed on a sled and track. So what accounts for the significant reduction in the forces required to move these stones? Well, the answer is friction. Friction is a force just like the push or a pull, and it has two main aspects. The first is the force applied to the object by gravity, pushing it into the surface it is sitting on, and the opposite but equal normal force that the surface is exerting back on the object. The second aspect is the coefficient of friction, which depends on the surface area and the materials used. Let's use this cup as an example. It has a surface area, which will be sitting on the surface. It also has weight, so it will be acted upon by gravity. When I exert force on this in the form of a pull, I'll only be able to move it once I overcome this coefficient of friction. Now, if I use these two coat hangers to create a kind of a track, I'll be reducing the surface area and making the surface a little bit slipperier. So reducing the coefficient of friction. So it should be much easier for me to pull it.
Through these experiments, the significance of technological advancement has become evident in the role of megalithic transport. And as the data has shown, the more technology used in the movement of megalith corresponds directly to the decrease in forces needed to pull these objects. As there is no real evidence of the megalith transportation methods used in prehistory, experiments like these are crucial in trying to further our understanding of how these megaliths may have been moved and the overall level of technology that a civilization may have had. Thank you for watching.